detoxification was always a difficult one for me in the beginning because I always err on the side of do no harm. And so my question was always, how do you assess? How do you know? Even just challenging someone. I used to be really afraid of doing a challenge because, you know, what if they get worse? So my thought has always been to just increase antioxidants as much as I can and start with food. That's my foundation, right? Start with diet, build on the nutrition because you can always build on that. And also because I truly believe that nature is smarter than I always say nature is smarter than the smartest doctor because there's a lot of things in food that are cofactors or that help absorption, right, or, or that help interaction that we don't know about. So if, we, if that's your foundation, then we can always add to it and grow. Now, there are those patients that no matter what you do, you may not be able to change their habits much, but I work at it, and I work at it really hard. So I think the most important thing is that we no longer ask the question, are our patients toxic? but really how toxic are they? Because we know that we live in a toxic world, right? And we are all toxic. And so to me, I liken detoxification to kind of like preparing for sailing. Because I'm not a very good sailor, but I've always wanted to be, and I work at it, and it's one of those things that I work really hard, but I just don't think I have the knack for it. So to me, when you prepare for, when you're getting ready to sail, what do you have to do? You have to prepare, right? It's not one of those things that you can be really spontaneous. You can if you keep your boat well stocked and you know exactly what to do, right? So sometimes when you do, you sail and you have this great trip and the water's beautiful and the scenery's beautiful and all goes well. And the same thing happens with detoxification, right? But sometimes you can reach a little bit of rough seas, right? And you have to watch out for other boats. And sometimes they get a little closer to you than you think they would. And, and sometimes they're not as advanced as you or they're beginners like you used to be. And so you have to take all those things into account when you're detox detoxifying a patient because you do uh, encounter sometimes some, some tough times. Um, and so the most important thing, I think, is to try and avoid those as much as you can. You know, like I always tell my patients, I wish I had this crystal ball and I could just look into it and tell you exactly what's wrong. But unfortunately, I don't. So I do the best that I can with the tools that I have and also, too, with, with patients and how compliant they are. And remember that who's a toxic patient? aside from everyone you see. Who's the most likely to be a toxic patient? Any chronic disease patient, right? And now we have more and more literature showing that. I mean, we've thought that for a long time, but we actually have literature now that shows that. And, you know, Bruce Ames has devoted his life into studying the gene-environment interaction, right? And I think that's especially important when you're talking about detoxification because the more that you know about that patient and their genetics, right, the better you can develop the detoxification program for them. Because we know that it's environment and it's genetics and it's th those two together that really help us develop, unfortunately, our toxic burden and what leads to chronic disease. Now remember that it's not just about the exposure that you know of, right? But that there's a lot of prenatal exposure that goes on and it's it's cumulative because, how should I say this? No, I feel like I work really hard to cut down toxins. And, and most of my friends would say that I'm a little bit of a fanatic at it, but I disagree. But in any case, even when you're living in the most pristine part of the world that you can find, and I happen to be privileged enough to be able to do that part of the year, even then, you cannot escape plastic. You cannot escape the fact that most things you buy in the store are wrapped in plastic. Even you, sometimes your organic vegetables come wrapped in plastic, right? Or they're frozen in plastic. And what happens when we freeze plastic or when we heat plastic? We know dioxins are released, right? So really it's all about being conscious and trying to decrease it as much as you can. So we know that we can find chemical pollutants in the umbilical cord of young born's blood, right? And 180 of the 287 chemicals that was tested in this 2005 study by the Environmental Working Group proved that. It's a, a little bit overwhelming sometimes when you really start to think, you know, put it all together and think of how much we bathe our bodies in toxins. And so to me the question becomes, how do you decrease your toxic load? And it's by being aware and trying to find alternative ways because we're constantly in contact with toxins. So, and where do they come from? 
Well, they come from everywhere, really. Now, this is the CDC's fourth national report on human exposure to environmental chemicals. Now, they tested 212 chemicals, and they found all of them to be present in the blood and urine of most Americans. I'm going to go through the six, what I thought were six ones that were found um, virtually in everybody and that I think are a big deal. And then there are things that we can decrease. So number one, polybrominated biphenyl ethers. They're flame retardants. Right? They build up in, your, in our fat tissue. They can cause damage to our nervous system, to our liver, to our kidneys. They've also been implicated in sexual dysfunction and thyroid problems and uh, in brain disorders. I don't know about you, but I have been seeing over the last two years a lot of young men with low testosterone. Am I alone in this? So what's the number one cause? I think it's toxins, because we know that they'll bind the receptors, right? They can act as some hormones, and some of them may downregulate, may upregulate the receptors. We don't really know. I mean, we know, for example, with cadmium, it can do many different things to the hormone receptors. And so my patients always think I'm a little bit weird when I say, you know, we're going to work on toxins, and sometimes I use some products that they think are used for women, or they'll be labeled as something for women, and they're in men. But I've, ha I've had great results without having to resort to testosterone replacement because what happens when you replace testosterone in a young male? You're shutting down their own production, right? That's not what we want to do. We want to augment. We want to try and help their body make more. Number two, bisphenol A. I know you're all really familiar with it, right? It's found in plastics. But, it, you know, I was surprised when I found out that it's also in canned linings. And so I really try to tell my patients, no canned food, but that's almost impossible at times. And unlike in Europe, where most canned goods also come in glass, unfortunately, we're still not able to do that in the U.S. Some organic um, products do, but not all of them. Now, it's a, bisphenol A is reproductive, developmental, and a systemic toxicant. It's, it's estrogenic. And I really worried about its effect on children, too, not just the environment. Fluorofluorooctanic acid. Don't you just love your nonstick cookware? <laughs> yeah, I know. My husband had a really hard time with that one. And more and more, I, I think there's something to be said. I mean, no matter what you use, you're going to have some side effects, right? I mean, you, even if you use Pyrex, you know, I wonder, okay, what don't we know? Is there lead in it? You know. But you, you can at least cut down your toxic load. You can make better decisions or use a really good, uh, high-grade stainless steel, that sort of thing. Now, perfluorooctanic um, actinoic acid is also found in certain food packaging. So it's not just a nonstick um, cookware and also in some heat-resistant products. And it also works to increase, decrease fertility and... Uh, in the um, liver and immune system. So just be conscious of that. What about acrylamide? Now we have some fried chicken on there, but it also happens when we make bread, right? The top, the crust of the bread. And any, uh, anytime you take a carbohydrate and you cook it at high temperatures, and we know that its exposure has been linked to cancer and some neurological dysfunction. Mercury, which you've already heard quite a bit about, may cause permanent brain damage. And of course, seafood is the most common root. But actually, I, I disagree a little bit with that slide because uh, you're going to see another slide later on that shows it's, if you look at air, the only thing is that not everybody may have mercury amalgams, right? But if you do, the, you're getting more exposure 24 hours a day because it's constantly being liberated. And like, you know, that from fish or shellfish, which would, you'd have the greatest exposure right after you ingested it. And methyl tert-butyl ether. Now, this is a gasoline additive that's no longer being used, but it's still in our environment, right? And in our bodies, unfortunately. And you can also get it from secondhand smoke. And, another, and again, reproduction can affect reproduction and neuro neurological system. So this is six. 
but I just went through. Keep in mind there's a lot more, but it, the more conscious you are, the more you can work towards reducing it.